Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. A couple <coughs> minutes after now, but it looks like everybody's gotten a seat. Um, so, good morning. Uh, can everybody in the back hear me okay? Yeah. Good? Uh, thank you. Um, so, I'm Andrew Sounds. I'm the uh, Partnerships Lead at, at the Center for Open Science. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about improving integrity, transparency, reproducibility through connection of the scientific workflow, or the scholarly workflow. Um, so what this is going to mostly cover, uh, that's not what I expected there. Okay. Uh, there is a first bullet that's not showing up. Uh, shows on here, but not on there. Um, there are three things that I, I want everybody to, to take home uh, from this conversation. The first one that you can't see uh, is that this, this talk is going to be about the Open Science Framework. It's a platform that we build uh, at the Center for Open Science. Um, the first bullet is that this is a free and open source platform. Uh, so something that anybody can use. There's, we try and reduce the barriers as much as possible to get in and use it. Um, a second thing is it's designed to add efficiency to the workflow. Uh, so to make lives of users easier, reduce steps that are, that are involved in doing various tasks. Uh, and the third thing, and this is a, a big important point, is we want to bridge the workflow. We want to connect to lots of other tools and services uh, across the workflow. Um, so keep these things in mind, including the one that you can't see. Uh, and we'll kind of cover various points in there along the way. Um, so why is this an important thing to be talking about right now? Uh, I've got a, a snapshot of, of several different news articles that, are, that have been out uh, in scholarly communication outlets. Uh, I think some from, from uh, large journals, some from uh, various popular press locations, uh, all talking about different issues in science around reproducibility, um, around uh, publishing of results that are, are false, so confirmatory issues in publishing of research, uh, power failures, so talking about like sample sizes and power analysis issues. Um, these are a variety of different types of problems that are getting lots and lots of discussion in, in many areas of science and, and scholarship more generally. Um, all around published literature, uh, all things that people want to find ways to do something differently to support and improve. Uh, and everybody's looking for solutions. So on one hand, what we're looking to do is, is address these types of problems. Uh, on the other hand, what we're trying to uh, work on are things of barriers and incentives, these kind of discrepancies that exist. Uh, so one way of thinking about this is uh, norms and counter norms. So in, in scholarship or research in general, uh, you might think of these types of norms that are outlined on the left here as being the ideals, the things that we'll want to, to work on. Uh, open commu communality, uh, open sharing, universalism, uh, the idea that evaluate research for its own mer merit. Uh, disinterestedness, meaning that you're not necessarily looking for a particular outcome, you're interested in the question and discovery. Uh, organized skepticism, consider all new evidence, even against one's own work. So you could discover something and then disprove yourself as a concept. Uh, and quality is a, another point. Um, the counter norms are the alternatives of these things. Secrecy and closed, as opposed to open. Particularism, meaning very focused on particular problems uh, and around reputation. So is, is this, uh, are we qualifying this based on somebody's reputation or the merits of the work itself? Uh, Self-interestedness, meaning research becomes a competition as opposed to this discovery process. Uh, dogmatism. Uh, all about finding and promoting one's own theories and findings rather than trying to consider new evidence and evaluate whether something is valid or not, and quantity versus quality. So the point with this is uh, these are the, some of the types of challenges that exist uh, that are drivers and, and cause conflicts and in, in, uh, incentives um, and generate some barriers around those issues. Uh, so as, as uh, one way of, of looking at this, there was a study that was published in 2007 uh, that surveyed 3,247 mid and early career scientists. Uh, this was through the NIH funding. Um, and it, it talked about uh, how people, uh, what sort of ideals people are subscribing to, so this norm and counter norm issue. Um, people say that they believe in one thing and then they practice something different, this type of issue, right? So the first one up here, 
uh, is looking at the, the gray bar that you see on the left is the norm. Um, and this is one's own behavior. So what do you actually practice? Uh, or So you're looking on the left, uh, what do you practice? The norm, everybody says, yeah, I practice the norm. Uh, there's a small percentage that, that do the counter norm. A second point on it is uh, peer behavior. Um, what does everybody else do? The left shifts a little bit further. Uh, so everybody else is practicing the counter norm. And the third thing uh, is, is, uh, is shifting even further. So others' behavior entirely. So the perception is, uh, I believe in this, I do this, everybody else does this other thing entirely. Um, which, which presents <laughs> significant <laughs> problems, right? Yeah, um, so we're up against this type of problem. So it's somebody else's problem, it's not my problem in practice, uh, and this is a difficult thing to overcome. So this is some of the context that what is what we're talking about. We've got these sort of practical barriers and, and issues. Uh, they're difficult to overcome. We've got these issues of perception of me versus others. Uh, and we're, we're trying to figure out how to address these things. So just a little bit of context before I, I get into the actual uh, platform discussion. Um, some context on, on our organization and who we are and what we're doing, why we're working on these things. Uh, COS is the Center for Open Science. Uh, we were established last year, 2013. We describe ourselves as a nonprofit tech startup. So we are an independent 501c3. Uh, but we operate more like a, a tech startup. Uh, we try and be quick and agile and iterative and all of those things. Uh, we began with four leading foundation funders, so we are grant funded right now. Uh, at this point, we're, we're somewhere between 14 and 15 million dollars in startup funding. I, I didn't have the dollar amount available right now, but we're in that range. Uh, we're in Charlottesville, Virginia, not with the University of Virginia, but nearby. Um, and our team has grown very rapidly over this period as we're trying to build and, and grow to, to be able to sustain and support what we're building. Uh, we've got about 25 full-time people, about 20 interns at any given time. Um, and a, an important thing to underscore here is our team is mostly software developers and researchers. So we bring researchers onto the team uh, to provide expertise in the things that we are trying to build and support. Uh, and our mission at the bottom here, as you see, high-level goals mission is to improve openness, integrity, and reproducibility of research. What we are often focusing on is scientific research, but what we think is that this applies to research generally, which is why I'm calling it scholarship today. So I'm gonna go ahead and get right into what the actual uh, tool is and, and what it provides. This is the URL down at the bottom, osf.io, so if you're on a computer and you wanna follow along on there, uh, feel free. Um, we try and make it very accessible, so all you have to do is go there, create an account, uh, it's easy, it's free. Um, we describe it here, as you see, as a project management uh, tool with collaborators sharing. Uh, it's a file storage system. It's lots of different things, all of which you'll see some examples of as we go along. Um, but the first thing you have to do is create an account. Um, so once you do that, uh, you have the opportunity to modify some account settings. You can update your information. Uh, we basically have a profile system built into this, so it can be internal and then representation of your profile within the system so others can see you know you're a researcher at this institution um, you can add social media information employment information education information so you can basically build your your profile uh, and we try and connect this to lots of other similar type tools and services so uh, the social section will have your orchid id your twitter handle your facebook page your linkedin page uh, github id all sorts of different things that might be relevant uh, the next section is your dashboard. So we approach this as a, as sort of with sort of a dashboard concept. Uh, the black bar that you're seeing up at the top, that's, that's your main menu bar. It has my dashboard and then explore where you can look at public projects. Uh, what you're seeing here is where you would land once you have an account. And there's two main uh, columns here. Project organizer is the left side, which is basically like a, a file tree. Um, it's a bit more complex than that, but what you can organize is uh, your registrations, your projects, uh, you can use your frequently used list, you can organize it all sorts of different ways that are useful to you. Uh, we leave this very flexible and let the user specify how they want to organize things rather than impose some sort of structure on that. 
On the right side, we have create a project. This is a very uh, quick onboarding method. So basically all you have to do to create a project is type a title of a project in there, and this can change later. Um, a description, which is optional, and a template, which is optional. So if you were to create multiple projects over and over again with the same structure, you could use a template to do that. Um, say you had a lab and, and you wanted uh, data collection and data analysis and publications and all of these things to be organized, organized in certain ways, you just use a template to do that. Um, once you hit create, it'll uh, create that project and we'll go on to see what that looks like. Uh, you would land on this page. So I have a new project. Um, and this new project uh, is, is pretty bare bones at this point, but there's a central menu bar in the middle here. Overview, files, wiki, statistics, registrations, fork sharing settings. And I'm calling out a number of different features. So we're on the overview tab right now, which shows you the entire project. You see the, the project's uh, file tree, and that's only for that project. Uh, over here we have the sharing uh, section of the menu. We have citations. Everything in here gets persistent um, unique IDs. So, and, and we generate citations automatically for people based on that. Down the bottom right here, you see a log. Um, every single action in this system is automatically logged for the user. So it creates uh, a history and, and tracks provenance, which is very helpful in understanding how research evolved. Uh, and actually very difficult to do sometimes if, if you don't have anything like this. Uh, the top right on, on that, uh, the red box up there is private and make public. Uh, and you see that private is the one that's suppressed right now. The default option on every project is to keep it entirely private. And we never require that it become open. We allow users to operate privately as long as they would like. But we also make it very easy if they want to become open with how they're doing it. Um, so that can happen at any point in time. Uh, so that's some highlights there. I'm going to go ahead to the next section. Uh, the wiki. We have a, a wiki uh, tool built in here. Um, it's pretty simple at this point, uh, but we're adding a lot of new features to it right now, actually. Uh, so just some highlight points, you can access the wiki in the menu bar, wiki history, so you can click on there and you can see the entire history of changes on the wiki, so you can look at differences. Uh, and over on the right, you can add new or edit uh, a wiki page. Um, so that's the highlight there. Uh, and next thing is, is components. So again, we do not impose structure. Uh, we let users choose how they want to structure their projects. Uh, the way that we provide support for that is a thing called components, which could be considered like folders of a project in some ways. Um, so if you were on a project page here, you would see add component. You could click that. You would get this box over on the right, which says name your component and choose a category. Some of these categories uh, now and in the future will have certain uh, activities sort of related to them. Um, you know, certain types of rules that, that could be there. But the default one, or the, the most generic one is project. And you can nest as many of these components under as, as desired. Uh, so this really gives users the, the freedom to structure their project however they like, um, to create as many different, you know, branches of the tree as, as are needed uh, to correctly <coughs> represent how things relate to each other. Uh, once you complete a component there, you'll see down here, uh, this is the top level, a new project, and data analysis plan would be the component of that project. Um, so you see it represented that way, and if we were to go back to the top level uh, view, you would see uh, a tree structure at that point. The, the next thing I, I want to cover is adding contributors. Uh, so we call users on the, the system contributors. Um, you could call them collaborators. Uh, and what we're talking about here is, is adding uh, new users to projects and giving those users different types of permissions. So we have permissions controls. Uh, so all you have to do here is when you're on your menu bar, you, you find uh, sharing, you do add contributors. Uh, you click that button down here, you'll see select from the results. So I would type somebody's name in here. We typed Courtney in here. We get the list of results. Um, we choose the plus sign. It adds it over to the right side. We specify permissions. We have read, read, write, administrator, the, the main levels of permission. 
um, and then you would submit and add that person. So in this case, this is somebody who is already in the system, but you can also add people who were not in the system already and they'll be sent an invitation and then by email and they can join that way. Um, so we basically put all the control of this in, in the user's hands. Uh, one other thing to call out here is, uh, you, it's probably a little too far away to read right here, but uh, for this particular user, the one that we were calling out, there's additional information below her name. And that information is a product of her profile that she created. So she will get a, a richer view, uh, a rip, richer representation of her identity in a add contributor list if she's completed her profile or added information to her profile, which helps her differentiation when people have uh, common names. Um, so, so that's one thing there. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, privacy is an important thing for us. Despite the fact that we would like people to be open and transparent with their practices, uh, we recognize that that is not the norm right now. Uh, so we try and support people where they are. That's really sort of an underlying uh, philosophy here is don't make people come to us, help us go to people, provide support in the ways that they want right now. Um, so if, if you're in the private state right now and you want to make it public, we provide a warning that says once this project is made public, there's no way to guarantee that access to it, uh, access to the data it contains can be completely prevented. Which means you go public, somebody might access it at that moment, you may go private again, but somebody might have already gotten it. Uh, so we just try and make a very explicit statement there, uh, warning that. All right, continuing along, um, the another thing here that's obviously a, of significant importance, since this is what most people use, uh, is uploading files. People use this as a file storage system. Uh, we have unlimited capacity on this right now. I mean, obviously there is a limit, but um, <laughs> but we do not impose any sort of limit uh, on people. We have not had that abused yet, so uh, please don't abuse that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's free, uh, and we allow people to put as much stuff in here as they would like, uh, and we, we want to support that. We're funded to support that. Um, so we try and make that process extremely easy. Uh, if you're looking in your file tree here, there's an actions column. There are two buttons here. Uh, in this case, click one of the buttons for the place that you want to upload it. Um, <coughs> and, uh, a modal will come up and you know, allow you to pick it from your, your directory. Uh, the alternative is take that file and drag and drop it on here. And we have a drop zone integration, so it will just be added to, to where you dropped it. Um, so we try and make that extremely easy for people to use. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we do logging. So every activity in there is logged. Every action from adding a file to adding a contributor to removing a contributor to making it public to making it private, all these things get recorded in the history of the entire project. Um, and this is whether it's public or private. So if you had it private and you make it public, everybody can see what was done, which is really important for transparency of process. Uh, a second thing that, that we think is a very high, high value feature is versioning. So uh, this is something that is a challenge for a lot of people and often done very manually. Um, so we try and do it in, in a more automated way. So basically if, if you took a file and you went and uploaded it and then you drop a new version of the file in, it will create a version history for you on that. Uh, so down here in the bottom right you see version one. It was submitted by this user at this date and version two, this user, this date. Um, and on the right, there's zeros, which are the number of times that file has been downloaded, and then download buttons. Uh, so this is nice in, in the sense that this helps support collaboration and automated versioning. Uh, it also helps people with uh, their, their needs for understanding what sort of impact they're having. They can see how many versions, or how many different downloads have happened on each version. Uh, and then above that, you get there's the download button there where you can just download everything at once. So the, the next uh, feature and sort of concept I want to introduce here is one that may be less familiar. Um, but this is the, the concept of registrations. Uh, show of hands in the room, how many people have a sense of what I'm talking about with the registration? Okay, that's, that's what I was expecting. Okay. 
Um, so this is, this is something that's like increasingly uh, emerging in, in this space right now. Uh, in, especially in social sciences and in some life science areas, it's the idea of, of registering, uh, well, there, there's kind of two, de two uses of this, uh, registering studies before they're done. Uh, and this is to avoid changing hypotheses to accommodate outcomes, right? So you have a hypothesis, you, you, have data, you collect data, you do your analysis, you don't like the analysis you get, and then you say, well, I meant to actually have a different hypothesis to <laughs> change it. Yeah, that's not really ideal for, for quality in science. So uh, a lot of different disciplines are starting to adopt this concept of registration, where at the very beginning, you, you register your claim someplace. You say, I'm going to do this study. This is the question I'm going to ask. This is the protocol, the analysis plan that I have. And when I get to the end, I will have evidence that that was what I was intending to do. And that way, if the results come out in ways that you don't like, you know, that's the result. That's how it is. Um, you can do a different study, but, but those are the results. Uh, so we provide a, a registration mechanism to support that. And what this, this is basically is uh, on a project, there's registrations up here. You hit the registration, new registration, it provides you with uh, a form here, which there are various templates for. We have an open-ended registration where there are several text box, boxes to complete. Um, the user types in whatever is required for those boxes, and then it creates this copy over here. And you can't see it very easily, but there's a watermark behind this. It says read only. And this is a frozen copy. So the whole point with the registration is that you can't change it after you do it. Otherwise, that would defeat the entire purpose. Um, so it's a completely frozen set of copy of the project at that point in time. And then when you get to the end of the project, you can refer back to that and have evidence that that was the intention. Um, we also use this in another way, in that people can create a registration at any time in their project. So say you just want evidence that uh, you know, when, when you did, before you did the data collection, you create a registration. Before you do the analysis, you create a registration. Before you publish this next thing, you do a registration. If you just want to see easily where the project was at that point in time, um, that would be a case for creating a registration. Uh, so people do use it that way sometimes. Um, these are, as I said, these are increasing in use. Uh, a number of journals are requiring these. Um, there actually are changes in some journal practices uh, shifting towards this type of thing as a priority for actual review and acceptance. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's increasing in uh, awareness and popularity and usage. Um, so the next thing, uh, sharing work. So I mentioned earlier the adding contributors and the ability to control permissions and things like that. Uh, a different dimension of this is sharing in a private way. So say that I, I do not want to add somebody as a contributor, which would elevate them to the status of collaborator. Right? They're not really a collaborator. They just are somebody who needs to see my stuff. And they need to see it when it's private. Um, perhaps a peer reviewer, perhaps a, fund, uh, a funding um, reviewer. What you would do is create a view only link. <coughs> here, create a link. Pulls up this box over here, where you get to generate a new link to share a project. You can name what that is. Uh, you can describe it as for peer review. You can choose to make it anonymous if you want. If you make it anonymous, it wipes all of the information in the log history and everywhere on the page, everywhere on the project, uh, any identities. So it is not going to the file level and wiping identities out of files. That's obviously a risk. Um, but at the level of contributors and versions and history log and, and all of that, uh, it is wiping identities off and showing as anonymous. So this can be extremely helpful for peer review and anonymous peer review in particular, or blind peer review. Um, the second aspect of it is you can choose which parts of the project you want to share in that capacity. So you could just choose particular components or you could choose the entire project. Uh, and I guess the, the last important point on this is you can expire these links. That's a critical thing, right? You might have a several month period where you want somebody to have access and then you don't want them to have access anymore. So you would go in and delete that, that, that uh, access level. Uh, a critical topic to bring up in here, of course, uh, is unique and permanent IDs. 
Um, so our philosophy, and I, I think a shared philosophy in here, would be that scientific content or scholarly content must be easy to cite and annotate. Um, <coughs> without being able to consistently get to something, uh, it, it simply is not going to be as reliable. So right now our, our strategy is we have uh, GUIDs that we generate for this. We are exploring other options, whether we go with DUIs or easy IDs or, or any, any sort of different types of persistent identifiers. Um, but right now we have our own local GUIDs that we generate. They look like these, uh, OSF, IO, and then five uh, characters. And these are randomly generated characters. We do not let people specify their own set of characters, so no vanity character or uh, vanity URLs right now. Um, and my point with this is these are three different types of things entirely that all have similar types of persistent IDs. This one is a project. This one is somebody's profile, so is that individual's profile. And the third thing is a file. So in all cases, there's persistent access to many different parts of, of the open science framework and, and somebody's experience in there. All right, uh, so a, a, a third thing that I mentioned at the beginning that's important for everybody to take away here is we are trying to connect the workflow. So I just talked about all internal features, and now I'll talk a little bit about external. Uh, we have add-ons. So our model is we have an API. Other tools and services have APIs. We want those APIs to connect. And we want to bring value to our users in our service as well as users and uh, product owners of other services. So right now, these are the five that we have in production. Uh, Dropbox, GitHub, Dataverse, Fixture, Amazon S3. If you're not familiar with these, uh, Dropbox is for general file storage, GitHub for code, Dataverse, uh, I imagine a lot of people in here are familiar with Dataverse, but uh, social science data repository largely. Uh, Figshare, a general purpose repository, uh, mostly, or at least begun for figures. Um, and Amazon S3, a general purpose uh, industry data storage service. Um, so we chose these mostly because they had very accessible APIs and they had a fair amount of usage in certain areas of, of uh, our user groups right now. So what happens here is when you're in a project and you're looking at your menu bar, uh, there's an option for settings up on the right. You go to the settings, it provides you a selection of add-ons that are available. We have three categories right now, documentation, storage, and other. Uh, the storage section shows the uh, six, the five or six add-ons that we have. The, the other one that's on there is not an option, actually. Uh, it's OSF storage, it's internal storage. Um, you choose the one that you want to add, and then down here, it lets you configure that. So we do this via tokens. Um, so we do not keep credentials. We're using the tokens. Uh, and. Once you do that, you assign it to a project, you pick a folder or whatever the appropriate um, structure is within the other service, and that becomes available on the project. So the value that this adds is uh, if I have a team that is using the OSF, uh, but I happen to be the only one on the team that uses GitHub, nobody else has GitHub IDs, nobody else wants to have GitHub IDs, um, but everybody else wants to be sure that they can see the things that are in there, even if it's private. Um, I can authenticate my GitHub account with our project, and then everybody on the team can interact with that GitHub account, uh, that GitHub repo, through the OSF, uh, and the opposite. So we do bi-directional as much as possible. So I could add something to GitHub, it would show up here. I could add it to here, it would show up in GitHub. Okay? Um, and that's true for pretty much all of these add-ons, and that will be the idea for most add-ons going forward. So these are all storage, but we want to do a whole lot more than that. Um, and as I said, connecting the workflow is, is the philosophy here. Uh, so some other examples of things to kind of illustrate what we mean by across the workflow. Um, DMP tool, this is a, a service that was created to help uh, researchers produce data management plans that are compliant with requirements from funders or from other organizations. So the idea here is, is that service right now <coughs> ends at the creation of a DMP. So somebody goes in, they see the requirements, they complete various questions, they get a DMP out. They submit that DMP to a funder, and end of story. 
Um, what we want to do is take that plan and shift it into the OSF and make it an active living document, something that people can use as a guide to actually creating their entire project, which ideally is a starting point for the project. Um, so, so we think that that would be a, a good addition for people. Uh, a second thing is DataBib. Uh, DataBib, RE3 data, um, basically, basically both being a repository or a catalog of repositories of data repositories. Uh, and the idea in this case would be to provide a data repository lookup service. So somebody is managing their data in the OSF. Uh, they get toward the end of their project and a journal or funder requirement says that they have to now deposit that data someplace else. Where do they deposit it? They don't know. So the idea would be to have uh, DataBib and RE3 data be the lookup service that provides suggestions based on the type of data, the type of discipline, various criteria. Uh, and then the thing that we'd like to extend on that is adding in checklist. So this repository that you've been suggested has these requirements in order to do deposit in, those, in that repository. Uh, it accepts these types of formats, uh, these types of files, the size, it requires these different metadata fields, um, those kinds of things to basically help researchers transition from where they are with how they're working with it to a state of deposit, which we know is a, a major hurdle for people. Um, a third thing, and this is similar to the other storage services, but more preservation oriented, uh, is Databrary. So Databrary uh, already does sensitive video storage very well. Um, they're doing lots of video on uh, different types of interactions with participants and studies. Um, it's a hard problem. It's a problem that we do not want to solve, but we want to help other people uh, access that feature. Um, so we would connect to their service if you're in the OSF and you had appropriate rights in their environment, then you would be able to access both things from that <coughs> in that case. Um, okay, so that's, that's the end of connections for right now. Um, so I just want to show a couple of different uh, use cases uh, from real people so that you see kind of what we're talking about in more detail. Um, so this is a real user. This is Erica. She's a PhD student uh, at UC Riverside in psychology. Um, so she, full disclosure here, she worked with us as an intern for a semester. So she, uh, she got fully on board with this process uh, <laughs> in, in that environment. Um, but the, the really positive thing is, as she was working with us, as a, she worked as a developer with us, even though she's a, a psychology grad student. Um, she came and worked with us. Uh, she saw the value that this could bring to what she does, and she took it back, and her entire lab adopted this. She's not in charge of the lab, but uh, her lab believed that this was something that would significantly improve how they were working on things. Um, so the tools that they use day to day, and these are not things that we support entirely right now, but Qualtrics, Dropbox, SurveyMonkey, and R. Uh, we have Dropbox now. We actually do have an R library where you can be in R and access public data in the OSF. Um, so you could call data from the OSF and do analysis in R. <coughs> um, Qualtrics and SurveyMonkey are things that we'd like to support in the future. Uh, as far as the features that she said brought the most value to what they're doing are things like version control, collaboration, a wiki, uh, the wiki they use for all their lab notebook and meeting uh, documentation. So when they have their weekly lab meeting, um, they're recording things in their wiki for their project in the OSF. Uh, and it's just helped with sort of consolidation of all of these things. A the second case, and this is a fair bit different, um, this is a, Rodrigo is a, a researcher in bioinformatics down in Mexico City. Um, they have lots of different types of uh, genetic data. Um, so they use things like next gen uh, sequencers, pipelining software, they write a lot of their own software. So they've got the problem of how does everybody in their team make sure they continue to have access to the software, and, um, different parts of, of things that they have in their, their project. Uh, so the things that they felt were extremely useful for them were version control, file sharing, the GitHub and Dropbox integration, <coughs> um, and then public sharing. They really wanted to be able to make this consolidated view of their work public and, and visible. Uh, they do this in a gradual way. They're not making everything instantly visible, um, but they wanted to be able to make it more easily visible as, as it's represented across multiple services. 
A third one that some people in here may be familiar with um, because of uh, uh, Norm um, is, uh, is OSF in the classroom. So this is Project Tier, uh, which is at Haverford College, and I think, I think they've presented here before, actually. Um, the problem that they're trying to solve is how do you teach undergrads how to make research reproducible and verifiable? They've got that. They've got some uh, various programs that they do, workshops and things that try and teach those different techniques um, and at least helping people be aware and thinking about these problems. So they find the, the OSF to be extremely useful for organization of documents and data, uh, the command files as people are, are writing these and needing to know how they're doing the analysis that they're doing. Um, the metadata, so being able to describe the parts of what they have, and the file sharing generally, um, you know, basically across the team and across uh, classroom groups. So those are a couple of examples. Uh, there are a lot of other use cases that we have, um, but these are some of the, the more prominent uh, common uses. So if, I, I think I promised this in the billing, so I thought I would uh, put this up a little bit. Um, if you're interested in this, this is what, how this is built. Um, I'm not a, a developer on the team, so I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on this, but our, our CTO is here at the meeting he presented yesterday, and uh, he could certainly talk about more things if you're interested. Um, but we are a Python shop. Uh, it's all Python and JavaScript. We use Git uh, to do the versioning within. Uh, we use MongoDB, Taku, uh, MX for the database structure, or the the NoSQL database. Um, we use Ansible for automation of, of uh, the entire process. Uh, Elasticsearch is what we're using for the indexing. Uh, I put OSF API because that actually is an important part of, of our infrastructure. We have an API that we use ourselves. Um, so we, the, the core infrastructure con uh, interacts with the top level infrastructure through our own API. And other services will obviously be able to interact that way as well. Um, we use Rackspace for storage and Linode for hosting. So that's what the environment looks like right now. Um, so just to close out uh, and provide context on how this stuff connects to some other things also, um, if you're interested in what we're doing, if you're interested in collaborating or getting involved, uh, this is what Share is built on. You might have heard that yesterday. Um, or in other venues, but OSF is the infrastructure to support share. Uh, so one way that you could contribute is to be able to uh, add content into share um, and partner on curation of content. That's sort of a future direction that, that uh, we'll have lots of discussion about, I'm sure. Um, a second thing that we're just getting started is serving as an ambassador. So we're going to start an ambassador program. So these types of use cases uh, can be shared at various institutions so that uh, more people know about this and more people can choose whether this works for them or not. A third thing that some people in the room may have already heard about, uh, as a complement to this service and to try and help support these broader goals, we are funded to provide uh, training and consulting on reproducible and open practices, reproducible statistics and open practices. Uh, so basically we go around and we give workshops, training sessions, we have conversations with lots of people uh, about how to make statistics more reproducible um, and the more and the entire process more transparent um, use of the OSF to sort of support these things. Uh, we've got <coughs> workshops in the next few months set up at Princeton, Yale, uh, Duke, um, a, whole, a whole series of places uh, that I'm blanking on the entire list of right now. Uh, but we would love to offer these in more places. So if, if this is of interest to you, uh, I'd love to talk about that. We usually do it through libraries as much as we can. Libraries as neutral uh, places that are not solely interested in departmental uh, activities. Um, so yeah, uh, and the last thing, uh, we are always hiring. So if, if you or anybody else would be interested in working on these types of activities, um, please see our jobs page and please uh, encourage people to apply. Uh, it's a, it's a, a very active, um, growing environment and it's exciting to be sort of part of this. Uh, so we'd love to have more people join. Uh, if you have questions, I mean, I'd be happy to take questions now, but if you have things later, uh, these are the places to contact us. Contact at OSFIO, 
uh, or Twitter is OSF Framework. Um, and we'd love to talk more. So thank you very much for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions.